Hello and welcome to Startup, the show about what it's really like to start a business. I'm not Lisa Chow. You probably recognize that by now. I'm Alex Bloomberg. I'm back in the seat as I am from time to time to talk about a new show that we are launching at Gimlet. We're launching this new show today, actually, and we're going to play a clip of that show later in the episode. But first, I want to tell you the backstory of how this show came to us. It came through the inbox of Matt Lieber. Matt Lieber, my co-founder, president of Gimlet Media, who joins me in the studio right now. Hey, Matt. So tell me about this email. I got an email from a guy who said, hey, I'm a big fan of Gimlet, and I started my own podcast. It's a business podcast, and, you know, I've been working on it, and I think it could be, you know, a great fit for Gimlet. Now, that email is not that uncommon, is it? Correct. Not that uncommon. Right. In other words, you've gotten plenty of emails like that. Gotten lots of emails like that. And there are a lot of business podcasts in the world that are variations on the, like, you know, 10 ways to get to $100,000 of passive income per month right. will reveal the secrets. <laughs> right. It's not really what we're trying to do at Gimlet. Right. Right. <laughs> There's right. a lot of scamminess out there. Yes. And so, but there is an art to writing cold emails. He had a very simple, bold statement. He started by talking about me and not him. Because uh-huh. everyone is like a narcissist, so you always start your cold emails with the word you. Right. Dear Mr. Blo- Bloomberg, you have been a huge inspiration. And you're right, I am more interested all the time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, now you're like, Ooh, <laughs> I hadn't been paying this? attention to what you're saying before you said yeah. you. Yeah, and then you say, and this is who I am, and this is what I'm doing. Uh-huh. And he just, it was short, sweet, to the point, uh-huh. and it was very low commitment. So the guy who wrote that email, his name is Josh Muccio, and the low commitment thing he was asking Matt to do was listen to this podcast that he'd made. And we'll get to that podcast in a minute. But first, here's Josh and his account of sending that email. It was a shot in the dark, (laughs) I realized. But, okay, so I've been listening to Startup since the very beginning. That show was like therapy to me at a time in my life where I needed therapy. Say say more about that. Why did you need therapy? This is going to sound really, really weird, but I had just sold my business Mm -hmm. and I was kind of like a child that didn't know where he belonged. One day I've got this job and I'm feeling successful. The next day the thing is sold and I have some cash, but I don't have any purpose in my life. So Josh Muccio, I guess, is clear right now. Before he was a wannabe podcaster sending cold emails to Matt Lieber, he was an entrepreneur. And I knew this. But what I didn't know when I got on the phone with him was the fascinating backstory to how he became an entrepreneur in the first place, which he told me during this conversation we had. turns out it all started his senior year when one of his professors decided to do this project with his students. The teacher decided to have on a bunch of investors and like we could pitch an idea at the beginning of the class. And if we did this entrepreneurship project and like turned a profit in three months, the paper we had to write was half the size as the alternative paper. So I was like, oh, yeah, I want to take the easy road, <laughs> which I know. Why, why would starting a business be the easy road? Wait, but, wait. Yeah. You were taking a class your senior yeah. year. Yes. And like the professor set up this thing where investors would come to the class and students would pitch them ideas. And yeah. if your idea got accepted, your reward was that you only yeah. had to write a paper half as long as everyone else did. Yeah. I mean, I think he was he was an entrepreneur. He wanted to in- encourage entrepreneurship. And I think it was And that genius. was his motivating tool. That is amazing. Yeah. So Josh, in order to write a shorter paper, pitched an idea. He pitched a website where people could get their cracked iPad screens fixed. And lo and behold, his idea won. And that was the moment where Josh was set on his career as an entrepreneur. Just kidding. Josh ran his little business for three months, wrote his half-length paper, graduated, and immediately got a job as an accountant. And that might have been it. He might never have written to us. We might never have been talking to him on this bonus episode of Startup, except the financial crisis happened. Josh got laid off. And he learned what a lot of people learned around that time. Sometimes the safe route isn't actually that safe. He and his wife were expecting their first kid. He had no idea what to do. And so he went and checked out that old website that he'd set up in that class his senior year. I just logged into Google Analytics to see how much traffic there was on this website I'd built, iPadScreenRepair.com, which literally, it was a WordPress site. I built it and then just 
didn't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. Then logged in a year later when I got laid off, and we had, I think it was three or 400 people a day on this site. And of course, the name of the site was iPad Screen Repair, so people were looking for iPad screen repairs. So you you got laid off, you went back and you're like, what's up with the site anyway? And you found that three or 400 people a day had been coming to the site, clicking around, trying to get somebody to repair yeah. their iPad screens, which you had not been providing yeah. because you had your day job as an accountant in Florida. Yes. 300 to 400 people a day looking for somebody to repair their cracked iPad screens. To Josh, it seemed clear. The business he'd proposed could actually work. And so he set it up. He hired some people. He started actually responding to people when they wrote into him on the site. And gradually, year over year, built the business until by the time he sold it three years later, he had five full-time employees and they were fixing 30 to 40 screens a day. But after he sold, all that was gone. He had money, not enough to retire on by a long shot, but enough to give himself time to really, truly stress about what to do next. And that's when he discovered Startup, this podcast. He started listening way back in the first season when we were first launching the company. And it got him thinking. He developed an actual interest in entrepreneurship during the course of running his company. And he was falling in love with podcasts too. Maybe this would be the next thing he'd do. He'd start a podcast. And it'd be about that moment, that pivotal moment, when a person with an idea tries to raise money. He found some equipment. He learned to edit. And he got in touch with some founders who were trying to start companies. And he got in touch with investors who were looking to invest in companies. And he started interviewing them about each other. And that became his first season of a show he called The Pitch. And for a first season, it was fine. But Josh wanted to be better. So he started studying. He called people in the industry to ask their advice. They told him to hire an editor. So he did. They told him to make it more active. So he adjusted the premise of his next season. Instead of just interviewing founders and investors, he actually got them in the same room and recorded the actual pitch the founders were making. He was capturing things in real time as they were happening. And it was at that moment, deep in the recording for season two, that he realized this was working a lot better. I think it was probably the first time that we had investment happen on air. And when investors were negotiating with the founder because their valuation was too high, and just this tension in the room was palpable. You could tell a deal was on the line, like it could actually happen. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was a real thing, and we just happened to be recording. And I think I stumbled on the best thing I could have done, which is that I didn't try to control any of it. Mm -hmm. We put the founder in a room and the investors in a room, and we walked uh, into the mixing booth, and we're not even in the room. And then it just happened. I didn't have a voice in any investor's ear. We just let it all play out. And so it's true. It's organic. It's real. And that, it turns out, is really exciting. And that brings us back to the email in Matt Lieber's inbox. It was an episode from season two that Josh wanted Matt to listen to. And Matt did. And then Matt asked me to listen. And I did. And we both agreed we liked it. We talked it over and we decided to make Josh an offer to acquire his show. We put together a deal, we'd pay him for the IP, the show name, and then we'd hire him full time to continue hosting it. We'd also hire a staff to help produce it and give him editorial and engineering support. We got on a Google Hangout with Josh to lay it all out. And what Josh didn't reveal to us, again, until we were putting together this episode, he actually recorded the very end of that call. And he kept recording after we signed off as he headed out of his office to tell his wife what had just happened. Turns out she'd been right on the other side of the door. Eavesdropping. Well, did you? How much of that did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear them say they want to offer me a job? <laughs> I didn't hear that part. I you didn't hear that. But I, you assumed. I came over when I heard acquire the show. Are you recording? <laughs> yes, I've been recording. Um, I heard you say something about acquiring the show. Yeah. So this seems like a no-brainer. <laughs> like, well, it's a question of like. Do I want 2% of a really, really big pie, or do I want, you know, 100% of a smaller pie that I build myself? Um, I don't want to just think so narrow-sidedly on our um, current money situation no, that we make a hasty no, decision. It's not, you know? about, it's not about current money situation. It's about how you have felt which is that you're lonely. Oh, you're right. You want the team of people to work with. Right. And 
And for that reason alone, it would seem like a no-brainer to me. This is unreal. I'm like, like this is like an out-of-body experience. Oh my goodness. We've been like working in a cave. It feels like a cave for so long. It's like somebody noticed. <laughs> oh. They're like the best fit. The best possible fit that I could imagine right. for the pitch is Gimlet. Yeah. We feel the same way, and we hope you guys do too. So stay tuned after the break to hear the first half, the first episode of Josh's show, which is now the newest Gimlet show, The Pitch. Welcome back to Startup. And as promised, here it is, the first half of Gimlet's brand new show, The Pitch. I'm Josh Muccio. Welcome to The Pitch from Gimlet Media. On this show, we capture real entrepreneurs pitching real investors for real money. Late last year, we invited entrepreneurs to a studio in San Francisco. Each founder came for one reason, to try to raise money for their startup. Hey, how we doing? George? Yeah. I'm Josh. We followed the founders into the room where they pitched to a panel of shrewd investors. These are real companies, real investors, making actual decisions to invest their money on the spot. And we caught it all on tape. On each episode, we're going to follow the story of a founder's pitch to investors, right up to the moment when everything is on the line and the investors decide their fate. This week... Really, my goal is to build a billion-dollar company. How many women did you study? So it was 50 on baby scripts with okay. the optimized visit schedule okay, being that's on the only monitor. 50 women. In this episode, co-founder Juan Pablo Segura pitches baby scripts, it's a startup that hopes to revolutionize the way expectant mothers receive prenatal care by connecting them directly with their doctor through an app on their phone. Juan Pablo wants to harness the power of big data by letting technology take the place of doctor's visits. Now, it's one thing to use an app to order some chicken pad thai, but when it comes to pregnancy, is more technology really the answer? We leave it up to our panel of savvy investors to decide. I'm Phil Nadell with Barbara Corquin Venture Partners. Phil co-founded one of the largest syndicates on AngelList called Barbara Corquin Venture Partners. If for some reason the members don't bite, then the thing falls apart. Phil is a straight shooter looking for companies without a lot of question marks. This is Jillian Manis. My fund is Structure Capital. Jillian is something of a legend in the world of venture capital. In her early 20s, she survived domestic abuse that left her living in shelters in New York City. She was able to pick herself up, start several companies, and is now a multimillionaire. You can have the most incredible product, but if you don't know how to talk about it, you're gonna have a problem accelerating it. Jillian tends to take center stage and really drive the conversation. My name's Jake Chapman with Gelt Venture Capital. Jake founded the venture arm of Gelt Inc., an investment firm with over a billion dollars in assets under management. They're going to shut you down on that name. It's definitely trademark infringement. As a former attorney, Jake brings a lawyerly mindset into a pitch. If a founder can hold up under cross-examination, he might just invest. Hey, I'm Howie Diamond, and I'm with Ranch Ventures. Rounding out our panel of investors is Howie, who founded the VC firm Ranch Ventures. There needs to be a moral and ethical kind of code that's, that's aligned. Howie is looking for altruistic companies. He'll only go in on a startup that's making the world a better place. Okay, on with the pitch. All right, Juan, you're on. Rock our socks. Right. So, yeah, exactly. Socks off. All right, cool. Um, so, hello, everyone. My name is Juan Pablo Segura. I'm one of the founders of Baby Scripts. Uh, growing up in a family of six, my mother being pregnant was a very familiar and beautiful concept uh, with my siblings and I growing up. Um, but it was also uh, a scary time. You know, my mother actually suffered from three miscarriages. The reasons why were beyond any person or doctor's understanding. No one knows why problems still to this day occur in pregnancy. And so we said, you know what? It is estimated that 15 to 20 percent of all pregnancies in the U.S. end in miscarriage. And often there's little warning about when and why these miscarriages occur. So we said, you know what? Technology and big data can start answering some of these questions. 
So Juan Pablo and his co-founder Anish set out to create Baby Scripts, a company that takes already existing technology and puts it to work for expectant mothers. There is no company that has been able to like really take connected medical devices and make them the standard of care. And everyone's talking about taking costs out of the hospital, which is really expensive and into the home. Mm-hmm. You can't do that without connected medical devices. Connected medical devices. That's just a fancy way of saying medical instruments that are connected to the internet. In Baby Scripps' case, they are two things probably everyone is familiar with. There's a blood pressure cuff and a weight scale that are both connected to the internet and a patient... Basically, every week of their pregnancy, Baby Scripps users take their blood pressure and weight in the comfort of their own home. That information is uploaded automatically to the app, and it sends that right to their doctor. And if there's a problem... So blood pressure is too high, too much weight gain or weight loss in a week. And if anything's wrong, we tell the patient's doctor in real time so that the doctor can intervene. For patients with a low-risk pregnancy... Baby Scripps is meant to replicate a routine appointment and reduce the time patients spend with their doctor. Kicking off the questions is our straight shooter, Phil Nadell. So this is um, what to expect is, when you're expecting put onto pretty an Pretty much. We've essentially been able to automate a lot of prenatal care using our devices in our app. Instead of patients going in 14 times to see their doctor, um, through Baby Scripps, uh, patients only go in eight times. Do patients mind not um, having as many doctor's appointments? Because, I mean, there's, I I know I've been pregnant four times. The thought is, is that you worry every time, right? Um, They have peace of mind when you go to the doctor. Yeah, you actually look forward to going to the doctor, and yes. Yeah, so we knew that that question would come up. (laughs) When we talked to doctors, obviously patient satisfaction is very important. Like, for example, we've published two studies really showing the efficacy of the product. Um, This is actually really unusual. Most entrepreneurs just release their product into the wild and then see what happens. But here, rather than going straight to market with baby scripts, Juan Pablo and Anish first did this scientific study to gauge patient satisfaction with baby scripts. Essentially, They wanted to see if moms would trust the app as much as their doctor. And according to Juan Pablo, they did. But Jillian, the only actual mom in the room, isn't convinced. I would think, personally, if a a doctor were to say to me, listen, I'm going to give you this kit. Now I'm not going to, I'm going to see you half of the time. Um, this will take care of the rest of it. I would have a problem with that, actually. Yeah, so that's really where the controlled study was very important for us and the way that we position the product. So number one, I mean, we've proven that patients are more satisfied. How many women did you study? So it was 50 on baby scripts with okay. the optimized visit schedule okay, being remote It's only monitored. 50 women. But it actually was powered so, uh, clinically okay. like enough to be able to make a claim on it. Like we took a very like educated and, and scientific approach to it. So it was a powered study focused on satisfaction. It feels like Juan Pablo might be missing Jillian's point, which is, sure, you've done this empirical study with moms, But I am a mom, and I'm not sure I would be comfortable replacing my doctor's visits with an app that just says, don't worry, you're fine. Juan Pablo can tell he's losing his audience. So he doubles down on the argument he feels most comfortable with, big data. You know, we're generating 30 times the amount of data and touch points. But Um, how can you... How can you generate that much data just from a scale and a cuff? Isn't that just the weight and the blood pressure? Well, the, the reason why prenatal care exists as a category is actually to manage blood pressure. Everything else is an extension. Um, so if you look at every visit that occurs in the, in the pregnancy experience, you're, you're always checking weight, always checking blood pressure and answering questions. There are some visits where you're doing more, right? Ultrasounds, genetic tests, and we're not eliminating or, or optimizing those appointments. We're really focused on the routine appointments that occur early in the pregnancy and a few a little later on in the pregnancy. But you would think that the patient, in order to have that peace of mind that they would get going to the doctor's office where the doctor looks at them, checks the blood pressure, checks the weight, and says, you're looking good, thumbs up, you'd think they'd want that kind of reassurance each time that the doctor gets the measurements in order to have that increased peace of mind. And listens to the baby, the, you le, you know, you yeah, listen sure. to the baby's heart. You, I mean, there's a lot of things, you, le, you know, 
I'm a little concerned that it's not just the blood pressure and it's not just the weight. Does that mean when the doctor's getting this data from the kit, are they communicating it all with the patient and saying, hey, you're, you're looking good, the numbers look good? Or are they just saying, oh, by exception, they'll communicate if the numbers don't look good? Typically, I mean, the way we've set it up is that we alert them if there's an issue. Um, for example, blood pressure's too high, could be symptomatic of something called preeclampsia. Sure. Um, that's, that's very dangerous, right? So um, we'll obviously communicate concerns in that area. Um, but if things are okay and, you know, there are no triggers, most mm -hmm. providers, because they're very busy, uh, most doctors, you know, don't want to be bothered with a lot of data. But you would think that the Identifying an emergency like preeclampsia early on in the pregnancy is exactly why Juan Pablo thinks baby scripts is the future of prenatal care. The goal here, and as we continue to align the product, um, it's, it's really focused on being able to show that remote monitoring um, can start to move the needle in, in outcomes, right? And that's, uh, for example, the fact that we've had two interventions uh, through our program where we've saved someone's two, two pregnancies that we detected preeclampsia and we're able to triage that to the doctor. Um, so, you know, but really, just so you yeah. know, that would have been, I mean, a doctor's visit would have found that out as well. Well, the problem is that there are there are gaps right in between the doctor's offices. So you know they're they're waiting sometimes two, three, four weeks right. in between appointments. Right. You know we're capturing on average about 1.5 data points a week. So you know we have we're three times as likely right to detect okay. a problem like that. You can tell Jillian is still not entirely bought in, but for every objection she raises, Juan Pablo does have an answer. Why can't the woman just have a cuff and step on the scale and put it into the app, I mean, and just com communicate it with the doctor that way? Yeah. This is my, I have a little piece, you know, a little uh, calendar in the app, and every day she just goes in and tells what her weight is, tells what her blood pressure is once a week, and you're good to go. If I could just interject, sure. I think, yeah. on his behalf, I think the difference is they're harmonizing the data and looking for ir irrelevant data points before the doctor even sees it. If the patient has to look at the data, Well, you there's know, no data. It's but, You take your weight, you take your blood pressure, you're done. Oh, yeah, but that data is, is automatically sent to the cloud. What if the there's a, a, a missed uh, a input data point okay. where what ends up happening is if you're not controlling the flow and delivering, for example, devices that actually are accurate. So so there's all okay. that process okay. we're okay. taking care of, all and right. that's what's driving, right, the, the fact that— It sounds like Juan Pablo is slowly talking investors into his vision. In fact, he actually had Phil making his points to Jillian for him. And when you're a founder pitching your startup, one of the best things that can happen is for an investor to start giving your pitch. At this point, investors Jake Chapman and Howie Diamond start chiming in. How many births are there in the U.S. a year? So 4 million births. Okay, and about 60% are low risk? Yeah, 60% low risk. Yep. What's, um, what was the compliancy um, from your study? Uh, the compliance? Yeah. Yeah, so we published, and it's actually a lot higher now, but it's we, we captured 75% of women every week were taking their weight, their blood pressure, and using our app. Now amongst our, our customer base, uh, we're at around 90% compliance because obviously we're making— So 90% of people who get baby scripts use it every week. That's huge. Like, it's hard enough for tech entrepreneurs to convince people to download their app, let alone use the thing. You can almost hear the wheels starting to turn in Jake and Howie's minds. 90% compliance. And with 4 million births a year, 60% of which are low risk, that equals 2.4 million potential users. And at $300 a pop, the investors may be starting to take baby scripts seriously. The question is, who's actually using the product? Um, but now we're in more than 10 health systems around the country. So what does that um, represent in terms of patients? Yeah, so right now we have 1,000 patients under management. So the management. doctors are your customers. Yep. Okay, this is an interesting wrinkle. Rather than selling baby scripts directly to patients, Juan Pablo and Anish chose to market their product to doctors. This means that if a hospital decides to buy it, they then have to turn around and convince their patients to use it. In order for anything in digital healthcare to work, you have to work with the most trusted channel and partner in the healthcare experience, and that's the doctor. I could have gone consumer, um, and I think, sure, maybe I would have generated a uh, million dollars, maybe extra in sales, but really my goal is to build a billion-dollar company. 
The doctor is paying you for access to the data about their patients. The, for the entire experience. So essentially, we'll go to them and say, you know, we have an incredible kind of 21st century experience that you can offer to your patients. Um, and so you should purchase from us. And we'll also help you make more money for every pregnancy that you deliver. Uh, how do they um, make more money? Yeah, so this is, uh, it's very specific to how doctors get paid. Um, so doctors in this country um, get paid something called a global fee for managing the entire pregnancy. So essentially, it's like a lump sum payment um, for managing the prenatal care, the time spent delivering the child, and one postpartum visit. Um, so it doesn't matter if a patient goes in 40 times or five times, the doctor gets paid the exact same amount of money. This lump sum thing that Juan Pablo is talking about is also known as a bundled payment. And it's exactly how it sounds. Prenatal doctors make the same amount of money whether they see you two times or 20. And you can imagine how this could become a problem. So if doctors are making a flat rate, then they could have less of an incentive to see patients as often and have more of an incentive to see as many patients as they can, which could compromise care. But Baby Scripps embraces this problem. So we essentially help the doctors make more money because um, we allow them to still make the same amount of money, but they see pregnant patients about 40% less often in the office. And so they have 40% more time that they can use on another procedure, seeing more patients. Uh, and typically, uh, a practice will make about $600 more per pregnancy, and the cost of baby scripts is $300. Um, so they make about 100% return on investment when they work with us. And according to Juan Pablo, baby scripts fills in the gaps between appointments, thus creating a safer pregnancy and delivery. Yeah, and, and again, you know, how do you, how do you mitigate the risk of a C-section? How, um, how are you able to intervene if a patient's gaining too much weight in between visits, right? Well, you need uh, a system that can capture incredible amounts of data in between appointments and essentially intervene behaviorally if there are issues. In baby scripts, we've created the, the, the piping to be able to do that. Bottom line? Baby Scripps addresses a problem created by the current bundled payment model. But could future changes in healthcare threaten this? What do you uh, what do you make of the existential risk of the insurance companies yeah. changing their compensation plans and methods so that now they're not getting paid one lump sum for the whole pregnancy and they're getting paid per appointment or that kind of thing? I, I don't see that happening. I see it actually going the other way, which is it's gonna be more and more focused on uh, finding more things to include in that lump sum so that they don't have to pay as much for more services or, or problems that occur in the pregnancy. Juan Pablo sounds pretty confident that lump sum payments will remain the model for how doctors get paid. But he kind of has to be. After all, he's wagered his entire company on this premise. Because if he's wrong, if doctors start charging per appointment instead, Baby Scripps' whole business model falls apart. And with healthcare in flux the way it is, this is a pretty big gamble. How much revenue have you generated to date? I mean, it's around four hundred thousand um, dollars. In the last, because you've launched over the last year. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's been, basically been product. this year is like our first year revenue. Okay. Yeah. So, so this, this is year. like okay. the first year for us, and okay. so um, yeah, I mean, well, we've booked already four hundred. I believe I can get to about $700,000 by the end of this year with all the deals we have in our pipeline. I mean, if you really think about what we're doing, right. and this is where I think it, it really gets interesting, what we're, the model we've delivered is actually triple aim healthcare. Yes. Because we're reducing the cost of care, yeah. we're improving access to care, so we reduce the cost of care by 40%. We improve access to care because you can get prenatal care wherever you are, through the app and the devices, and we're actually improving outcomes. So that literally, you know, we were, we've had interventions where we save lives. Baby Scripps has done that. So what are you raising and what are the terms? Yeah, um, we're raising $3.5 million um, to really expand our sales reach and onboard 20 more customers, uh, health system customers. You're raising 3.5 and the valuation is what? Yeah, so it's a $10 million pre-money. Okay. How much of the three and a half million do you have committed so, so far? So about 2.5 million. Baby Scripps needs to raise another million dollars to complete this round of funding. Has Juan Pablo convinced investors to take a chance on his startup? Phil, our straight shooter, weighs in first. 
Well, I really like what you're doing, you're making great progress. I feel like you've, you've uh, attacked this, this problem in a smart way by starting with the studies to prove the efficacy, to prove what you're doing, because you know that that's what they're going to require, your, your customers are going to require. So I think you've approached it in a smart way. Um, I'd like to participate. Uh, so, that's awesome. uh, so I'm in for 250000 Oh, wow. Okay, that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. So Phil is in. Here's Jillian. I, um, I love this. And for so many reasons, I'm personally and professionally connected to this. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to do 500000 Jeez. And yeah. <laughs> what I'd like to do with that is, and just to be clear, um, I have a venture far fund, which is Structure Capital, and I have my own. So I would like to bring this to them to either do all of the 500000 or to break this out so that I do a piece of this, they do a piece of this, and then our LPs who get to directly invest have the opportunity to do this. But I'd like you to carve out 500000 for us. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Juan Pablo has just scored $750,000 in funding for baby scripts. Now can you hook Jake, the skeptical attorney, and Howie, our altruistic investor? Here's Jake. I, uh, I love you. I think you know this business like amazingly well. You've answered all the questions immaculately. Um, I, I think you have the prescription for success. Oh, nice. Is that a good one? Yeah. Hey. Hey. Thank you. Wow. I was um, waiting for it. I, too, really want to invest in this company. I think your, your round is, is all of a sudden oversubscribed. Um, so I'm feeling a little like I've got to, got to be scrappy here. We're a smaller fund. I'd like to do $50,000. Um, but I think, I think what you're working on is amazing. I think you're, you're making a difference in the world, a positive difference. And I think you're going to make a boatload of money. Yeah. And uh, when I can combine those two things, like, it really gets me excited. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So, Howie, can we make it quadruplets? Let's do it. I mean, look, it's, right. it's a no-brainer to me. You, uh, this exactly fits my thesis for my fund. I'm, I'm even smaller than, than Jake, so I write 25 to 50K checks. But, but I, I think th- those are the types of projects that I like to put myself into, that I like to participate in, you know, not only as an investor, but also as a partner to sort of help because that's what gets me up in the morning. So this directly fits the type of deal that I, that I really get excited about and and I'd like to be in for $30,000. That's awesome. This is so cool. Yeah, I, okay, this, I, I, I don't know what to say, except uh, I'll bring the, you know, I'd, I'd say cash, uh, wire, and, uh, you know, so anything that, uh, that has a dollar bill in front of it. So that's awesome, thank you. Congratulations, thank you your round is now almost yeah, full. Yeah, Congratulations. I, I actually, it's, it's, yeah, we're, we're almost you. there. All four investors have gone in on funding baby scripts. Juan Pablo leaves the room with more than $800,000 in funding. And he's not the only one who's excited. That's, I, yeah. I gotta tell you something, guys, I can awesome. do so much with this. I, mean, I will make sure that your investment is very, very good. I would put a million in if I could, to tell you the truth. In my head, I'm thinking. I have a so many people that I know in my network that would want to get Yeah. Juan Pablo crushed his pitch to investors. But what happened after the pitch may surprise you. When we come back, a lesson on what to do when a deal goes south. And all you can do is reflect on what went wrong. To find out what happened with Juan Pablo's deal, go right now and download the first episode of Gimlet's newest show, The Pitch. You can find it on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And keep your eyes on this feed for a brand new episode of Startup that's headed your way on Friday. I'm Alex Bloomberg. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.